Long-term viewers of the channel, do you recall this hallowed ground? A place where memories were made, setbacks overcome, knuckles skinned and triumphs celebrated? This series is the story of the new amphibious arctic vehicle project named Bernard. Building on ideas, skills and questions raised during the Allen lifeboat conversion, as a team we will share all those moments needed to get Bernard up north, onto the ice and making himself useful. Yes indeed, it's Alan the lifeboat's old slot at the boatyard. He set off over two years ago after nearly four years of modifications. I'll answer questions about that later this Sunday. Make sure you join us today at the Q&A at 6pm UK time, late morning or lunchtime across North America and into the evening east through Asia. Anyhow, the baton has now been passed to these fine vessels. In the meantime, good news. A lot of the materials have arrived and I got to the yard literally 10 minutes late to actually help the driver offload it. But anyway, pallets arrived. And so I stopped briefly for lunch in order to train myself to delay gratification. For inside that wrapped bundle kindly shipped down by the helpful and hyper knowledgeable team at East Coast Fiberglass Supplies, there was excitement. This is probably just to be on the safe side, as the only liquid shipped here were the little pots of epoxy pigment. Anyhow, comfortable yard furniture at a safe distance, lest the pigment ignites it, and I'm like a slightly special child at Christmas who's enthusiastically into heavy rolls of composites consumables. We all went through that phase, didn't we? Thanks in particular to Lee, who gave me a tour of ECFS's facility last year and who helped arrange this shipment, including some custom non-stop goodies. It's important not to overdo it with packaging opening devices, but you lot do get angsty if there's too long between the use of grinding discs. Likewise here. But I did do so carefully, as damaging the contents would be exceptionally bad manners, not to mention stupid and potentially expensive. I'll do a proper rundown of every component of this extensive, albeit not that complex, lamination job in another episode. Instead, let's serve the main course for today's update, for it is Sunday, and on Sunday we serve Gurit Corsell foam. This will live in between this will live in between two substantial layers of mainly carbon fibre, but also some other exotic fabrics. You saw these very expensive sheets some weeks back as they arrived, but here we go for a proper look. They are optimised for resin infusion with the perforations, but they will still be useful for a less exotic vacuum bag job, pulling vacuum across the core. And you will surely remember all those tests I did, painstakingly learning the what's and what nots of stopping laminates from splitting apart from a core. We're going to pass little tongues of glass fibre through the foam, and that's going to mean that we can hold the two sides together even more strongly than purely an, an epoxy bond to either side. And we're using the unidirectional glass because it's got an amazing adhesive quality to the two laminate layers. There's something about glass that means it just likes to stick and encourages really good interlaminate strength without the chance of delaminating. We decided that the most important thing with these through core tongues of glass is the width, which stops appeal starting. Length is less important, as once appeal failure starts, it'll continue. So I need to knock out a large pattern of 50mm wide slots to pass the glass tape through. The best solution I came up with was a 25mm leather punch. Two side by side should do the job nicely, once I got the hang of it. A reminder of how these tongues will fit in, invisibly doing their vital work, bonding to the adhesion promoting thin skin of glass and fitting to the inner face of both laminate layers. This isn't a mainstream technique, but I did a search around for others doing similar, and I came across this. Apparently some Scandinavian boat builders had been running glass fibre loops between the inner and outer skins, and somehow then filled the void with foam, instead of using rigid boards. So it's not just Bernard and me being avant-garde here, we really want the two skins and the core within to remain held together. I won't lie, I've had more fun, even on a pleasant summer's day with the podcast playing in the background, and I've chosen to angle each row of slots differently, so the orientation of resistance to delamination is not all in the same direction. 0, 90, 45 and minus 45, not dissimilar to the principle of varying the fibre orientation as you lay carbon fibre. It went okay, but it's slow, hand-jarring work. I wondered if my penchant for miniature power tools might assist. I decided that was a slightly stately process, it was taking me far too long, and so I've decided to buy um, another toy. Yes, good people of the channel, you can buy mini electric chainsaws. Quite why? I have no idea, but you can, and that's the main thing. Usefully, the chain width and depth is more or less right for our needs. Oh dear, that'll need fairing with some filled epoxy later on. Technique was the issue, as the saw wanted to skip. With a few more tries, I got progressively less hopeless, and eventually worked out that you need to brace the saw by holding the guard with a second hand, push confidently straight through the board, and then slowly eke left and right to get the correct slot width. Much better. 
This meant I now had a system, and one that was about four times faster than the manual leather punch. If I ever need to punch slots in leather though, I'll have the workshop stock perfectly for such revelries. It actually became quite fun and satisfying once I had the technique sorted, but as is always the way, by the time you become a ninja at a repetitive task like this, all of a sudden the task is over and you probably need not do it again for another year. This sheet is about two thirds of the core that will sit on the curved top of the mould. This would of course be the underside of Bernard once the shell is the right way up. I've gone for different grades and thicknesses of core cell. For the bottom and the shaped scoops that are on the mould are the cylinder-like rails at the top, I've gone for 100 kilograms per cubic metre density and 10 millimetres thick. These sections are the most curved and so will naturally resist bending, but I've chosen this fairly high density for resisting compression. For the sides and possibly the back, which are flatter, I've gone for a slightly thicker core to help stiffness, but then what I call a normal density of 80 kilograms per cubic metre. These won't be stood on. It turns out from the spec sheets that you, in practice, get a little bit more density than expected, so M80 is usually an average of 85 kilograms per cubic metre. In fact, here are those sides. Instead of being a whole sheet wide like the bottom M100 sheets, I have to do some measuring and cutting. Probably remember those tight radius curved bits at the top of the mould that I'm going to tackle later on as an intermediate phase after the first lamination day. More on why later, but it was on good advice from the team at Gurit. These sides do not go all the way to the bottom of the mould, or the top of the shell of Bernard once flipped upright. You don't want your core reaching all the way to the edges of your laminates, as they are vulnerable to damage and hard to bolt things to. Instead, I'll taper the core down and have a solid laminate for the edges. As I've found so many times in the past, it's simply not enough to commit what is what and how large a whole number of things are to short-term memory. It's always worth marking on the details for later reference and to help the pace of work on that all-important laminating day. Don't worry, channel members, there's still tons of space for your names to be written there for all eternity when the time comes. Some excellent straight cuts. Well done, my track saw. I'm finally getting to grips with it, even if I had to remove and bond back on the white glide strips with a super strong adhesive after they flopped off. I guess this is the bit where other channels would then go quiet and show you two minutes of real-time saw cutting, mostly so YouTube can fit in another round of mid-roll advertising. Not me, though. And now to a shortcut to making those slots. These two sheets are actually identical, so I thought why not grip them together gently and cut the slots in a one -er. Well done us. I didn't have enough time this week to taper some of the edges with the router, I'll tag that on to the end of another video, but to finish I thought I'd show you how the glass tapes will work. 600 GSM unidirectional, as 90 degree fibres would achieve nothing, and single ply, otherwise the tape itself would delaminate. It will be an S shape, not a U shape, to maximise strength. Oh, and if I have managed to post this in time fast enough today, which is Sunday, see you for the Q&A in a few hours' time. Bye.